Uh, uh, thanks very much. And um, first, a disclaimer, I'm not going to talk about um, any kinds of uh, strongly correlated materials specifically, but my talk is going to be a bit more generic, and I'm going to ask the question, what is generally being ne necessary to achieve um, non-equilibrium dynamics and to achieve that on timescales that make, uh, make them measurable and make them visible in experiments. And so today in the morning uh, at breakfast, James convinced me to put some initial slides in that would actually connect this field of non-equilibrium uh, dynamics in quantum systems a bit more broadly to other areas and actually head on um, try to contribute a little bit to the questions that he put up uh, this morning. Now, um, the uh, work that I'm going to present uh, has, of course, not been done by only me, but there are a couple of people who have been majorly involved in this. Uh, one is Joey Tyndall, who uh, recently moved to the Flat Iron Institute as a postdoc. And um, then there's Berislav Bucher, who uh, moved to Copenhagen recently on a fellowship. Uh, PhD student Cameron Bucher, who is in industry now. And uh, Carlos Sanchez, who moved to Spain a couple of, um, well, it's now a couple of years ago already because we had the pandemic. And so basically the work I'm going to present to you is um, kind of mainly in these uh, three papers here. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this last paper that we did most recently because that's a bit more technical. So I'm just going to explain some of the things that are in there without going too much into the details. But let me first you know, address some of these questions that James put up this morning. Um, why non-equilibrium quantum physics? So um, almost all of functionality arises in non-equilibrium systems. Equilibrium systems are usually, you know, shall we say, a bit boring because they don't do a lot. They basically sit there, do nothing, they have a temperature, pressure, and so on, but they don't produce any functionality. So even if you want just to have a, a little bit of current flowing somewhere, this is already a deviation from a thermal state. And of course, in physics, we are very much used to uh, just taking thermal states, doing a little bit of perturbation, and then explain what the functionality is uh, that we see in physics. But of course, if we look around us and we look at the real world, then this is generally not the case. So anything that we uh, see in the real world in terms of functionality is usually much further away from thermal equilibrium. So whether you actually look at humans, you know, biology, uh, basically all of our function uh, remains only possible while we are away from thermal equilibrium. As soon as we go into thermal equilibrium, we are basically dead. And um, <laughs> we cannot understand how humans behave but just perturbations around um, thermodynamic states. And similarly, you know, when you're used to um, having congested uh, trips to, your, to work or look at the pandemic, which then stopped these kind of congestions, then all of those types of um, systems that we see are not really uh, simple dynamics that follow from some, some thermal state and are just perturbations around that state. And so uh, when we look at uh, quantum systems now, then the situation is, is very different. In many body quantum systems, our assumption always is that if the system is a closed system, we have what is called eigenstate uh, thermalization. There is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which basically claims that any closed system that is just large enough, um, if you look at observables that have coherences in there, they will all oscillate at different frequencies. So within a very short amount of time, um, any local observable will look thermal and nothing much will happen. If you look at an open system instead, what you usually find is that these open systems are um, assumed to be ergodic. So you wait a little while, all of phase space is explored, and everything uh, goes uh, quite boring again. That's different from classical physics. If you look at classical physics, it's very simple to generate models that uh, give you much more interesting types of physics. So for instance, what I show here is a standard example of um, Conway's game of life where you have very simple rules of how uh, individual points uh, should evolve from generation to generation. So you just need these kind of simple rules for what should happen to each generation. And then you let the system run, and it never equilibrates. It never goes into any kind of stationary state. In this case, it produces these nice kinds of uh, breathers and so on. Now, you might think that driving a quantum system would do the trick. So you know, when we look at our world and how um, the whole world has ar arisen, that basically comes about because the sun drives the Earth, the Earth rotates. So there is a kind of periodic driving there. And of course, probably without the sun and without the Earth rotating, we wouldn't be there. 
But if you uh, take now a quantum system and you drive it, then it was shown in 2014 already that basically in uh, the generic situation, what happens is that any driving um, in Floquet engineering would actually over time uh, drive the system to what is a maximal entropy state. So you will get an infinite temperature state, which again is a kind of thermal state and uh, typically pretty boring. And so what they uh, conclude in this paper, that basically if you look at Floquet eigenstates, then they contain a mixture of exponentially many eigenstates from the undriven Hamiltonian and thus basically uh, all of the spectrum. And as an example, they show here what the occupation of a site in a driven system is and how that changes uh, for various different uh, quasi energies. And you see that this is basically always a half and it doesn't change much. So thus it seems there is uh, in the kind of usual sense, all the kind of uh, rules and laws that we like to use point towards uh, quantum systems, just equilibrate and go into thermal equilibrium very quickly. So what we've been uh, looking at is, um, of course, there are known exceptions to this. There are known exceptions like, you know, quantum scars. Um, there is many body localization. And of course, there are all of these experimental evidences that you can induce a long range order, for instance, generating a driven superconductivity. And so the question is, can we actually get a hold and grip of those types of exceptions? How would you um, need to uh, structure your system or what structure does the system need to have in order for it to not equilibrate quickly. And so essentially what we'd like to, uh, to do is to basically use a combination of dissipation, that's why there was dissipation in uh, the title, and uh, some kind of symmetries to achieve the following. That when you look at the standard system, and basically this explores all of space and undergoes defacing, and basically just uh, you know, equilibrates very quickly, We'd like to take parts of the Hilbert space and um, through dissipation damp out any state that is in that part of the Hilbert space. But then we do not want to just have a single point left. So it should not just be a single stationary state that is then typically this kind of uh, featureless uh, long time state. But we would like the dissipation to be such that there are islands in Hilbert space which um, do persistently uh, remain and are not damped out. And there may even be some kind of residual um, evolution that then would drive the system between these different parts. And um, what we need in order to achieve this is a combination of symmetry and dissipation. And I'm got, now going to explain how we can uh, identify whether or not uh, such symmetries are present. And in particular, what I want to show is that there is a reasonably simple uh, condition on um, any kind of open systems for these two things to be present. So how do we do that? Well, for simplicity, I assume that we have um, just a um, Markov type path uh, with uh, jump operators L mu. So that basically, Are yes? You basically addressing this thing of, through exceptional points in the complex plane? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have some work on that too, but that's not what I'd like to do here. So um, basically what, um, what, I, what, what I assume is that there are these operators L mu. Those describe our interaction between the system and the environment. And um, the assumption is that this environment is Markov. So basically any interaction uh, is uh, forgotten very quickly about the path, does not really remember what happens. And this is typically described in terms of these Lindblad terms here in the master equation. And then we have some uh, Hamiltonian evolution in this system. And now what usually happens, um, if you have just a Hamiltonian and no coupling to the path, all of the eigenvalues that determine the evolution of the uh, density operator lie on the imaginary axis. And as I mentioned before, we assume this um, eigenstate thermalization usually. And what that means is that these points are dense on this axis. And so when they're dense on this axis, that means a lot of different frequencies add up. And so any kind of uh, evolution is quickly gone. And the only uh, thing that we see is some kind of effectively thermal state in any of the local observables. Now, as soon as we couple a bath to it, what happens is that a number of those uh, states do attain a negative real part. So that means uh, that they will damp out and they will not be present forever. But basically, you know, a large part of these states damp out. And what is the red dots here? 
would basically be these, these black parts in the Hilbert space that after a sufficiently long time are not there anymore. And typically what remains and what always remains for these types of evolution equations is one stationary state at the origin that is shown here. And this one stationary state is typically the state that the system evolves to. And that usually is featureless, like in these examples of the driven system that I showed before. That state is not always very interesting, or mostly not interesting. However, there may be some kind of um, states that remain on the imaginary axis. And there may be more of those stationary states. So we do not necessarily um, always need to have all of the states requiring a negative real part except for one stationary state. And of course, we would like to know under which conditions this is necessary. And to cut a long story short, what we can show is that a sufficient condition for that to always be the case, so to always have you know, several stationary states and uh, some kind of points here that um, remain purely imaginary, would be to have an operator A that commutes with the Hamiltonian like a ladder operator. So it's basically you know, like a ladder operator going up and down a harmonic oscillator, but it doesn't have to be a harmonic oscillator. It basically just needs to be some operator with these conditions. And then uh, that operator A must also commute with all of the um, operators L mu that couple to the environment. As soon as that is the case, you're guaranteed to have some more states here on the imaginary axis than just one stationary state. On the other hand, and I'm not going to discuss that in detail, um, there is a kind of slight extension of these types of conditions. And uh, then it turns out that these conditions are not just sufficient, but they're also necessary. So essentially, unless you can find a kind of operator A that fulfills some slightly extended conditions compared to what I have here, you know there cannot be multiple stationary states. There will just be basically one state here, no yellow dots here, and uh, you, that means the system will just you know, kind of go to one single point. So we can therefore start looking for these operators A, and if we find such an operator A, we can identify what these uh, um, points here are. And then of course, what we can do is we can say, if you're interested in the long time dynamics from some initial state, so say you know, in the lab, uh, somebody starts from the thermal state, shoots a laser pulse on it, then waits for a while and sees the system ringing. Then of course the question is, those states that are in red here would have damped out and the remaining uh, evolution should be somewhere here if the dynamics equilibrate slowly enough. And for instance, you know, having two different stationary states here, and I'll show why that is always the case when you have these yellow dots, having two different stationary states here could, for instance, be the two kinds of uh, phases that you want to drive the system between. So one of those stationary states could be the initial thermal state. Another of those could be the a state that has undergone a, phase, a kind of phase transition in the kind of dynamical driving. Now, why is this the case? Why do we always um, have multiple stationary states in this case? So here are the conditions again. And then what we can show, it, yes? Yes, to understand. For this to happen, you need to have a continuum of states, always. No. Be because if you have a bound state in your Hamiltonian, a real bound state, the thermalization argument doesn't hold. Um, yes, but then you will have such an operator. So you can, then always oh. you can then always find such an operator, A, that fulfills these conditions. I mean, these ladder operators do not need to go up and down infinitely far. They can basically just truncate after one, <laughs> after one application. And so, we, yeah, so the, the, you will always find such an operator. OK, uh, so what, what happens if you have these conditions fulfilled and you have just some stationary state? And remember, there will always be at least one stationary state. Then you can take these operators A and A dagger and apply them from the left and the right. And when you do so, you get one of those yellow points up there, rho and m, that evolves in time with a purely imaginary eigenvalue that is given by m minus n times lambda. So m minus m, n is the number of applications that you have here. And of course, if you apply this operator A from the left and the right equally many times, you get a stationary state again. So having such an operator A means that you will have multiple stationary states. And uh, you can actually work out those stationary states 
with knowing A and one stationary state, you can work out other stationary states. Of course, it's not guaranteed that you find all of them. There may be another such operator A, and that may lead to some other stationary states. But if there is no such operator A, then there is no multiple uh, steady states, that's for sure. Yes? <coughs> Yeah, we assumed here time independent Hamiltonians. But yeah. since it's driven, it's, it's been. I'll talk about driven soon. So yeah, I'm I going to, to driven in a, yeah, in a sense that I'll tell you about. Yeah, I, I have an example with driven systems there as well. But for the kind of proofs that we have here, it's a time independent Hamiltonian for the moment. And so this means that we, under these conditions, are guaranteed to have multiple steady states, and we have a guaranteed. Um, what we call mixed coherences that lie here on the imaginary axis, and that the system may be driven between. Okay, so that basically would be driving from one stationary state to the other via these kinds of yellow dots here. And importantly, what we find is, and for those of you who do quantum computing, you will have come across this notion of decoherence-free subspaces. Decoherence-free subspaces are used for passive error correction. So basically, you search for a subspace of your system that is decoupled from the environment. And then states in there will not deface, will not decohere. This is not necessarily the case here. So when you actually work out this uh, product here, this L, uh, applying this operator L to rho n m and L mu, this is not necessarily zero. So for a decoherence-free subspace, this would be zero, meaning that these states are just by accident decoupled from the environment. But that is in general not necessary here. So these states are generally not decoupled, and indeed would not exist if the uh, environment were not present. OK, so, yeah? But they are not associated to any concept. Yes, no, and yes. I, I, I have this here. <laughs> so what, is, what now happens if you look at the long time dynamics? So you start out with some initial state, and then you can assume that um, that initial state through the driving gets mixed as much as possible, so the entropy gets maximized as much as possible under the constraints that this uh, existence of these operators A produce. So you have these operators A, that means that there are kind of um, not conserved quantities, but there are quantities that will need to rotate because you know, that um, those points here, no sorry, those points here on this axis are not conserved, but the oscillate with a given amplitude. And so rather than having just conserved quantities, what we have here now um, would be um, quantities that oscillate and have a fixed amplitude. So if you wait for long enough, what happens is that you can write down the state that you get in the limit t going to infinity, which we call the generalized Gibbs ensemble, which now has mixed everything that it can. So in particular, it is an infinite temperature state. There is no temperature beta in there anymore. But it does have um, terms in the exponent that arise from these dynamical symmetries here. So if this lambda, this, I, this value lambda that comes out of the commutator were zero, then this would just be the kind of typical uh, Gibbs ensemble with conserved quantities. But in general, these lambdas will not be zero. So we here have some amplitude and some oscillating terms in there. And the state, the long-term state, then has this form here. And uh, you know, under the assumption, I think it's a reasonable assumption, that everything that can mix will mix. I mean, that's you know, kind of equally an assumption like Einstein thermalization or ergodicity or this uh, driving hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And so basically, we here have a generalized um, kind of Gibbs ensemble where we take these dynamical symmetries that have lambda non-zero or even also lambda zero and, and write down that um, state after a long time. And that, of course, has the advantage that we can work out what the state should look like after a long amount of time, um, only knowing these mu j's. And the mu j's can be evaluated from the initial state. So if you know the initial state before the driving, before you do anything to the system, you can work out what these mu j's are. OK. Now, so much for the kind of theory. I'm not going to go into a lot more detail, but the last slide, I will try to say a couple more things about what we can do with this type of stuff. But I want to uh, just show one example that um, I like, uh, and that would be one not explanation of what happens in the experiments. I think I can't really make that claim. And um, 
<laughs> and I probably don't want to because otherwise I get lots of questions that I can't answer, but to see how in a simple model uh, this um, type of setup that I just explained can lead to um, superconductivity through driving or through coupling to an environment. And for that, all that we need is we need a system with eta pairing symmetry. So the nice thing about uh, having these types of dynamical symmetries is that we do not need a microscopic Hamiltonian. All we need to know is we need to know there is an operator that has this type of property. And so what we want is eta pairing symmetry. If you here basically take this eta operators, eta plus and eta minus, which generate a pair of uh, electrons or destroy a pair of electrons in a site, and they fulfill these relations here. And typically, that would be the case, say, for the standard Hubbard model. For the standard Hubbard model, the eta pair symmetry is a symmetry of exactly the type uh, that I need for this to be true. But it works for any other Hamiltonian that has this symmetry. Then we can now basically write down what is it that should happen in this system if we either couple it to the environment in such a way that this uh, environment only messes up the spins and not the charge degrees of freedom, because then basically these operators L mu will commute with, um, the, uh, with, with these operators eta here, or we drive it by applying, say, just the magnetic field. Because what would the driving do to the system? The driving would just kind of um, mess up all the spin degrees of freedom, but not the charge degrees of freedom. And um, what happens uh, then, I'm going to, to show in, in, a, in a minute. But if you now take this uh, Hubbard model and look at what the eta correlations are, then of course in this famous paper in, in 1989, it was shown that eta uh, correlated states with long range off diagonal order are high up in the energies. So basically up in the spectrum at very high energies, there are states that have long range eta correlations. And the paper showed that as soon as you have these off diagonal long range order, the state is guaranteed to be superconducting. So that's an old, an old result from this paper by Young. However, if you look at the low energy states, then there are competing orders. There's the spin versus the charge order. And that basically means that these eta correlations drop off very quickly. So the ground state is usually not, um, not uh, superconducting. Now, if we now do the following, if we now take our system, which has these spin degrees of freedom in there and these eta degrees of freedom in there, and we couple only to the spin degrees of freedom, either by some driving, so we drive via magnetic field. Magnetic field would only drive the spin degrees of freedom and heat up the spin degrees of freedom as much as possible. So basically, it would scramble the energy of the um, system, but of course would commute with the uh, eta operators and hence not destroy any eta pairs, or we couple the system in such a way that it dissipates just via a set and hence only to spin. Five minutes? Four minutes. Okay, good. Then basically what happens is that we would heat up this part of the system, but leave that part, the eta degrees of freedom, unchanged. Now, if we work out what should happen uh, then and just run the numerics, you see that you basically start driving or you start um, applying this kind of decoupling to the environment. And then basically through this uh, screwing up of the spin degrees of freedom, what you get necessarily are long range uh, correlations in the eta degrees of freedom. Why must that be the case? Well, when you drive or you couple to the environment, the state must necessarily be translationally invariant and we can show that it then must be translationally invariant also for the eta degrees of freedom. So we are basically, oops, we are basically guaranteed to here have um, in this driven stationary state to have the eta correlations constant of distance. That must be the case if the state is of this form. And hence, uh, the eta correlations, once stationarity is, is reached, must spread out and produce some long range order. Okay? So, what I've done here is I've um, not needed to use any kind of microscopic dynamics. All I needed was assuming that the eta, eta symmetry exists, that you only drive the spin degrees of freedom, and that you wait long enough until the spin degrees of freedom are completely scrambled. Then automatically, you must get uh, long range correlations between the eta pairs. And if you now look at what the um, amount of such eta correlations is, Sorry, this never really works. Uh, 
Uh, then basically, the amount of eta correlations is known by the Lieb theorem to increase with uh, n squared in unbalanced, unbalanced lattices. So that means that basically the amount of eta correlation and hence the strength of this uh, superconducting order parameter would depend on how unbalanced the lattice is. If the lattice is completely balanced, meaning the AB lattice uh, has equally many sites, then the um, amount of eta correlations you have is zero, but then this goes up depending on what lattice you have. And if you drive the system in the way that I've explained, what would happen is that all of these correlations would necessarily need to spread out over long distances and produce a superconducting state according to Young's paper. Okay, I thought already that I would be running out of time very quickly, so I'm not going to talk about any of the other things, just to uh, say that this kind of um, condition here, we found extremely powerful to study kind of long time dynamics and various different effects that can happen in quantum systems. For instance, you know, we used this to extend what I just showed to uh, frustration-induced pairing. We used that to show that dissipative time crystals can exist in cavities. Um, we found a version of uh, quantum time crystals in Heisenberg magnets. Uh, then there are kind of quantum many body attractors. This is probably closest to what you were meaning before. So that's possible to find here. And in this paper in 2022, we developed uh, kind of ideas for how these conditions could be turned into a more generic uh, theory of um, synchronization in quantum systems. Because you know, as James was saying this morning, what you need for any of these ideas to really work is some microscopic degrees of freedom to synchronize and to then couple to the macroscopic degrees of freedom in a synchronized way. So you can basically build on those relations and work out conditions for um, synchronization to happen either in a metastable way, if these, term, if these conditions are approximately fulfilled, then there will be some time scale over which um, um, synchronization will be possible, or stable if these are exactly fulfilled. And then of course in quantum systems there is this difference, this distinction as to whether um, expectation values um, are synchronized or the operators are synchronized. And so depending on whether you just have um, the expectation values synchronized, uh, we kind of divide, distinguish between robust and non-robust synchronization. In robust synchronization, the operators need to synchronize and not just the expectation values. And all of that we can base on these types of algebraic relations. So there is in particular no need to diagonalize the Hamiltonian or diagonalize the Limbladian to find out um, whether such systems can uh, have a can show synchronization. But of course, it's not trivial to always find these operators, but it's certainly much simpler than diagonalizing the system. And with that, I'm finished. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope I'm in time somehow. Okay, good.